It's a dark and stormy night in a castle, or it's a foggy afternoon in a green forest, or it's a bright and sun-dappled field filled with people playing musical instruments. Any one of these environments is a place where various revival movements over the decades have sought to resurrect the long dead and, for a while there, forgotten and demeaned aesthetics of the Middle Ages. I think the 2010s and 20s so far are certainly no stranger to revivals. Seems like every week or so we've got a new aesthetic, or core to add to our list, and more often than not, they aren't coming out of nowhere. Cottagecore, for example, existed in the 2010s, but really cemented itself as a stylistic powerhouse during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic when everyone felt physically trapped and dreamed of an idealistic escape. In a way, every one of these styles could be argued as a form of escapism, but none so prominently as the fantasy ones. Nightcore, Royalcore, Fairycore, Goblincore, but what's wrong with that? People have been using the fantastical and even regular aesthetics of history since time began. Everything comes from somewhere, and it's exciting to see people get creative with it. But there is one era that seems to dominate all revivals, even if it has never become overbearingly mainstream. Try as people might have, no one has ever been able to keep the Middle Ages dead. Through the Victorian Romantic era when the Pre-Raphaelites cemented the Middle Ages in a world of fantasy, to the swinging 60s when psychedelic folk singers became modern troubadours, to the 90s when an explosive interest in witchy horror and gothic styles brought medieval elements back into the fashion lexicon, our fascination with medieval fashion just keeps coming back. Come learn with me. Just a disclaimer here, when I talk about the Middle Ages, in this video, it's going to be referring to Britain and a bit of France specifically, because that's almost universally what these revival movements were pulling from. Sorry. But anyway, let's get into it. But first, let's hear a quick word from today's sponsor, Thrive Market. Due to my busy schedule, I often find it really difficult to find time or opportunity to go out to the grocery store when I need to, and when that happens, unfortunately, I end up ordering takeout delivery more often than I want to admit. But Thrive Market helps me with this problem a lot, and it's honestly been a huge lifesaver and time saver. Thrive Market is an online membership-based grocery store with a mission to make healthy living easy and affordable for everyone, with guaranteed savings on every order. They have a huge selection of amazing healthy and organic products, as well as home necessities too. I first ordered from them right after I moved into my new apartment and was able to stock up on my much needed flax seeds for making historical hair gel, a variety of spices and spice mixes that came with these super cute glass jars, as well as soup, snacks, and other vital stuff to keep around the house, like these incredibly convenient laundry sheets. And unlike a regular market, Thrive Market allows you to filter by your dietary needs. It took hardly any time at all, not only to search for these specific products that I want, but to filter by category or one of the many brands that they have available in order to more directly locate what I'm interested in, including any available special deals or discounts. Whether you're gluten-free, vegan, or keto, you can shop by a ton of various diets and values, and all products have customer reviews so you can read them before you buy. Thrive Market operates on a yearly membership fee, which is literally just made up for an overall savings. Plus, if it doesn't for some reason, they actually credit you the difference, so you've got a guarantee there. And orders over $49 ship for free with no fees or tipping or anything, which makes doing bulk shopping visits just that much more convenient. And your orders are delivered with carbon neutral shipping and from zero waste warehouses. You get to shop from home and save not only on the products that you need, but also on gas or public transportation costs and honestly, overall energy. For example, I managed to save just over $39 on this order that I made the other day. Click the link in my description box below or go to thrivemarket.com slash casro to get 30% off your first order and a free gift worth up to $60 when you join Thrive Market today. Thank you so much to Thrive Market for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to learning about medieval revival fashion. But you wish you had a Leary pipe. <laughs> The very presence of vintage clothes is, I think, something incredibly special. Much the same way with antique or vintage objects and buildings, old clothes survive for the same reason many old clothes don't. 
because they were loved. Even when they fell out of style, deemed ugly or useless by New Vogue, somebody cared enough to keep them. Forgotten clothes are a sort of love too, in a way. Rediscovered years and years later in someone's attic or basement or a warehouse, often they bear the marks of the person who couldn't bear to throw them out. Incredibly human marks that bring us immediately present to people of the past in the most physical possible way. Sweat stains, discoloration, tears and holes, shoddy alterations, lost buttons, stretching, places where someone nervously picked or pulled at the fabric or threads. Clothes say everything, not only about their original owners, but everyone that came afterwards, and about you for giving them a home again. In wearing vintage and historical styles and clothes, we give ourselves up as vessels for a collective human memory that bridges the past to our present. Heike Jens writes about 60s fashion enthusiasts as one example in fashioning memory, by immersing themselves into the fashion and music of the 60s, hunting for old clothes and modeling themselves on past styles as closely as possible, the 60s are here not distant history, but come to enter their own memory even though they were not even born in the time they now recall with their bodies. Where in a sense new fashion is the promise of a future and modernity, the popularity of vintage styles is a potent escapism that frequently comes around in eras when it's difficult to imagine a positive future to look forward to. But this too is complicated now that we're in an era where even new styles are not truly new, but self-referential from styles that over time become smaller and smaller cycles. In a world overrun by trend excess and drowning in mass-produced clothes, it's almost impossible to determine our style. Instead, we draw from the past, and in the relative stylistic freedom of the present era, we can also make our interpretation of past styles whatever we want. And very few styles have been so historically present and evergreen as the derivative, vaguely medieval aesthetic. The Middle Ages spanned over a thousand years, so of course there's a lot to draw from. Even people who scoffed at the Middle Ages as supposedly backwards and bleak, in particular the Victorians, still craved it. Derek D. Churchill writes in Modern Gothic, since the Renaissance, classicism has never fallen out of favor, and both English Palladianism and the neoclassical movement of the 18th century only reinforced the highest esteem accorded to works in the Greek or Roman manner. The most adamant partisans of Gothic were hoping for an anti-Renaissance, one in which modern Europe would realize that the Middle Ages were not the Dark Ages, but rather a Golden Age. But we'll get to that in a minute. When talking about revivals and their interpretation of history, it's obvious that we need to establish the uh, inherent problematic facts of the situation. Neither history nor memory are fixed beings. History itself is built from memory, and human memory is not only fallible, but limited. After all, we forget much more than we remember. And what we do remember is influenced by a wide number of different things. Our politics, health, worldview, what we are taught, our age, our gender, our sexuality. All of this culminates not only in a past that no one agrees on, but a past that should not be agreed on. The past will always be a site of interpretation and reinterpretation. People don't remember the past in a fixed scene, they remember it in bits and pieces, little flashes and images. It's non-linear and often and unclear, which is why fashion itself functions much the same way. When fashion channels and reinvents a vision of the past, it does so by touching upon fragments of memory. Our modern reinterpretations of medieval aesthetics, therefore, are not a direct channeling of the Middle Ages, but instead the product of an interpretation of an interpretation of an interpretation of an interpretation. Hence why today what we often call medieval revival actually has only little to do with genuinely medieval styles. It's often a lot closer to certain Renaissance styles and, even more poignantly, the Victorian romantic and pre-Raphaelite take on medieval with a few actual medieval elements surviving. The sleeves of a houppelande, the buttons of a kirtle, the metal jewelry and the belts. The rest has made its way through in a weird game of telephone dresses that look more like 18th century peasant wear, for example. Scrolling through Depop or Etsy right now with a search for medieval certainly reinforces this. It's a lot of stuff that looks closer to the Renaissance or 18th century. So why is it filed under medieval? Some of you might be asking why the hell we're still including these as medieval revival if that's the case. Well, 
There is a reason why this stuff is labeled medieval, and it's not just because a lot of people don't know what they're talking about when it comes to historical style. <laughs> As usual, the answer goes back in part to the Victorians. Historical accuracy be damned, the Victorians will have a take on your time period. I think the 19th century attitude towards the Middle Ages could be broadly summed up by this passage from Thomas Wharton's History of the English Poetry from 1824. We look back on the savage condition of our ancestors with the triumph of superiority. We are pleased to mark the steps in which we have been raised from rudeness to elegance, and our reflections on the subject are accompanied with a conscious pride, arising in great measure from a task comparison of the infinite disproportion between the feeble efforts of remote ages and our present improvements in knowledge. In the meantime, the manners, monuments, the customs, practices, and opinions of antiquity, by forming so strong a contrast with those of our own times, and by exhibiting human nature and human inventions in new lights, in unexpected appearances, and in various forms, are objects which forcibly strike a feeling imagination. Some scholars have argued that medievalism is a direct product of Victorian modernization. In the age of the Industrial Revolution, the pastoral past was rapidly disappearing and being replaced with a new mechanical future that both excited and unnerved people. As a result, people began looking to reinterpret the past to understand where we came from in relation to where we were going. But at the same time, Britain was hard at work colonizing half the planet and had a huge fucking ego and therefore had a political incentive to present itself as the evolved pinnacle of modern progress. And to do that, you need to make it sound like you're so much better than people of the past. So you ended up with a ton of British scholars and historians writing a lot about the Middle Ages, continuing the work of Enlightenment writers who pinned it down as the Dark Ages. And to put it frankly, most of these writings are total bullshit. <laughs> many of them are just poorly researched and many outright lie about the span of a thousand years of history. And as a result, still today, we're grappling with and trying to undo the damage of Victorian ideas of medieval history. However, much like the Middle Ages, the Victorian era was not a monolith, and a lot of folks didn't feel animosity towards the Middle Ages. Instead, they looked to it as a source of inspiration and fantasy. This flowed through the pre-Raphaelite art movement, and renewed interest in Arthurian legend, Gothic architecture, and the adoption of a medieval revival fashion sense. Inga Bryden writes, History was fashionable, and style itself with history manifests in visual and material details. 19th century medievalism had two key defining aspects, naturalism, which located simpler modes of feeling and heroic codes of action in both nature in the past, and feudalism, which was seen to offer a harmonious, stable social structure. The desire to restore connections within society in a rapidly industrializing context underpinned both aspects. Medieval revivalism in fashion was inextricably bound up with modernity, the very tactility and materiality of the armor emphasizing this. King Arthur was particularly ripe for remodeling in the context of Victorian chivalric codes because of his adaptability as a hero. Artists and writers could fashion him as an imperial conqueror abroad, a just leader at home, the focus of patriotic interest, a stoic husband wronged in love, and the ideal Victorian gentleman exponent of Christian manliness. The pre-Raphaelite artists had a jar direct influence on Victorian attitudes towards the medieval. The paintings of John William Waterhouse, John Everett Millet, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, Elizabeth Sadal, and Evelyn de Morgan all helped cement a vaguely medieval style in people's minds as the look of fairy tales, a concept that has endured through the ages and continues to persist in modern fairy tale illustration, like for example in the Random House Book of Fairy Tales illustrated by Diane Good, which was my childhood fairy tale book and had a huge impact on me. The costumes are all whimsically inspired by hoopalons with jagged sleeves, very nearly perfectly accurate peasant wear, the ladies' headdresses, and even the more 18th century ball grounds retain a distinctly medieval edge. Outside of just painting, William Morris famously explored medieval floral patterns and tapestry art with fantastical themes, like the one that I have on my wall, <laughs> which exposed the Victorian public to what would later become the arts and crafts movement which would hugely impact not only Victorian textiles, but interior design. But this interest in medieval aesthetics was just that, the aesthetics. Because 
As I said, they firmly believed they were a vastly superior society to those of the past, a mindset exemplified in statements like this one from poet John Jones in 1855. I prefer following in the wake of the steam engine, the electric telegraph, and the crystal palace, the glorious vanguards of civilization, rather than plunge into darkness to pick up the cast of rags of the monks of the Middle Ages, or to follow any other will-o'-the-wisp from the paths of common sense and public policy. The Victorians were for the most most part not interested in medieval society itself, which was regarded as the backwards dark ages but saw it as a pool to draw from visually, while also adopting aspects of medieval chivalry and pageantry. It should be noted, though, that 19th century France viewed the Middle Ages in a distinctly patriotic way, so the flavor of their revival over there was a little bit different. But either way, it's no wonder that people began craving a medieval twist on their fashion as well, and the Victorians were no strangers nor ignorant to the idea of drawing inspiration from fashion history. Susan Hodara writes for the New York Times, The embroidered gold fronds around the hem of a curvaceous 1830s ball gown reflect a Greek revival influence. The tabbed collar of an 1832 cotton dress draws from men's clothing of the 13th and 14th centuries. A deep blue and black silk gown circa 1850, mixes a swirling 18th century Rococo pattern and a Victorian palette. Several lines from an 1830 issue of the women's magazine Godey's Ladies Book, reprinted at large scale on the gallery wall, comment on this borrowing, ending with a caution, we should not snatch but select. During the 1840s, dresses too adapted to the trend. Sleeves became narrower, shoulders sloped, and waists elongated to a point. The resulting silhouette made women into walking, talking, gothic arches. Every new twist of women's fashion always meets harsh male critique at every turn, and this was still true in the 19th century. Literally, you could not win. <laughs> a number of men saw illustrations of medieval women and used it as a way to scoff at contemporary women's dress, like when William Morris said in News From Nowhere in 1890 that medieval women are decently veiled in drapery and not bundled up in millinery, clothed like women, not upholstered like armchairs. As annoying as it obviously is, love you William, but oh my god, women still saw these illustrations and many did seek to take inspiration from them in their own dress, in particular at events like masquerade balls and fancy costume parties. As mass printing of books and literary accessibility became more widespread, it was easier than ever for anyone to go to a bookstore and find an illustrated book on medieval fashion, such as Costume Historique by Camille Bonnard from 1829. Museums began displaying exhibits showing off medieval suits of armor too, fueling people's fantasies of the chivalric love between knight and damsel. And so, as a result, you got interesting details of fashion that harken back visually to medieval styles, like the front buttons of these 1880s ensembles, or scalloped or dagged hems, or these beautiful evening capes. Of course, the Middle Ages wasn't the only influence for these things, but it was certainly one of them. Now, in the Victorian era, of course, as you can see, the influence entered regular fashion a teensy bit, but for the most part, it was sequestered to the world of art and entertainment. And then, in the 1910s, you can see even more medievalism start to creep in with these super fun high collars and such. But there are two decades in particular that come later that are not only known as being the era of a thousand revivals, but a flashpoint for medieval revival as well. The 60s and 70s. There are a lot of folks who say that if you remember the 60s, you couldn't have been there. Those two decades saw, of course, the space age, which heavily influenced mod fashion, and the boho and hippie styles that surrounded the summer of love. But they also drew a lot of influence in reviving Art Nouveau styles, Victorian and Edwardian, prairie styles, and more. The 70s in particular got really interested in these flowy mock neck dresses, peasant day wear, medievalesque patterns and prints. But the 60s and 70s also saw a radical shift in the world of music, and with those shifts came even more wild styles than ever in the form of stage and photoshoot costumes that drew inspiration from the Middle Ages, in particular in the folk and psychedelic scenes. As the 50s saw the rise of rock and roll, the youth were increasingly being blamed for a lot of society's problems. Subcultures like Britain's Teddy Boys and Teddy Girls railed against this by channeling a combination of 
50s and Edwardian styles and incorporating them into a cool rocker vibe, for example. Subcultures began to become a force of the youth like never before, as post-war economic changes forced people to personally redefine their identities in society outside of class labels. But as the Teds began melting into a mainstream style, they were no longer a subculture. And so out of them grew instead the mods and the rockers. The rockers focused a lot on machismo and Hollywood idols like James Dean and Marlon Brando, all dripped out in denim and leather and parading through town on motorbikes. The rockers were a distinctly British working class subgroup and were extremely proud of it to the point of claiming to be just as oppressed as black Americans. Anyway, the mods on the other hand, short for modernists, came to epitomize the popular 60s style. They wore bright colors, 20s inspired tunic dresses, French haircuts, Italian suits, almost to the point of looking like cartoons. Mod was notable for its gender deviance. Many mod men were hated for being sissified dandies because of their clothes or the fact that they often wore makeup and rode scooters. And very importantly, mod style was directly influenced by female fashion icons like Twiggy, Jean Shrimpton, Kathy McGowan, and old Hollywood stars like Greta Garbo and Marlena Dietrich. Much like the rockers though, the two groups at perpetual war, the mods ceased to be a subculture once their style became mainstream. But many aspects of mods weirdness persisted and even through its mainstream adoption, people could see the remaining potential. And all of this got funneled through into the world of psychedelia. The word psychedelic was first coined by Aldous Huxley in The Doors of Perception in 1958, referring to the experiences of taking mind-altering drugs like LSD. It wasn't long before the popularity of these drugs amongst musicians would begin to directly influence the music itself and the aesthetics surrounding it. One of the most famous examples comes from, obviously, The Beatles. Paperback writer, Yellow Submarine, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Help, Strawberry Fields, and more all bear the undeniable influence of psychedelic drugs. And the band was extremely open about it. Ringo Starr once stated, I think LSD changes everybody. It certainly makes you look at things differently. It makes you look at yourself and your feelings and your emotions. And it brought me closer to nature in a way, the force of nature and its beauty. You realize it's not just a tree, it's a living thing. My outlook certainly changed. And you dress differently too. And you dress differently too is absolutely right. The world of psychedelia drove people towards romantic spiritualism, and with that comes the inevitable draw of medieval romance and fairy tales. People dropping acid became fixated on stories like Alice in Wonderland or Lord of the Rings or the Chronicles of Narnia. One artist who channeled these vibes strongly was Donovan, who incorporated Art Nouveau and Arthurian romantic themes into both his music and his image. You've likely at some point heard his song Season of the Witch, but many of his songs have a very distinctly medieval sound, like The Cellar of the Stars and The Song of Wandering Angus, and honestly just the entire Living Crystal Fairy Realm album, to be honest. <laughs> I wish I could find the queer street, the crooked me street that goes. The rise of folk music acts reinforced an interest in the natural, the ancient, and the magical. And these mystical leanings were channeled into the brands of new bands like the incredible string band who quipped, you name it, I've tried it, like the mysterious ancient things, tarot, magic, astrology. I'm fascinated by places where there's memory of druids, the magic stones, and ancient towers, woods, and secret groves. Art is the creation of beautiful space artists and living life in it. A year ago I'd have said I was in touch with the spirit which wrote all the songs I would have said I wasn't responsible for their existence. It was the music, but now I'm starting to take responsibility for actually creating them. <sighs> if my line delivery sounded weird there, that's not an accident. They literally just wrote it like that. <laughs> Another British musical act that leaned heavily into the medieval aesthetic was Sun Forest, who had just the most delightful and whimsical vibe. They quite literally called themselves troubadours, the medieval word for traveling musicians. Their song Overture to the Sun is chef kiss fantastic. <laughs> Album, 
which is absurdly hard to find, has some of my favorite 60s songs of all time. There's just such a solid sense of fantasy and joy in it, which I think exemplifies the very best aspects of the medieval aesthetic. It's antithetical to so many parts of the Middle Ages that we've been led to believe. The darkness, the dirtiness, the despair. Sun Forest presents us with a medieval revival that challenges that perception and presents a Middle Ages of sunshine. And then you had The Fool. The Fool was a Dutch art collective and band, and I think they may have leaned into the pseudo-medieval aesthetic more than anyone. I mean, just look at their costumes, the album art, everything. And their music was literally so medieval adjacent. I love it. God, I love it. <laughs> The Fool also did costume cover art and set design for The Beatles, The Incredible String Band, Procol Harum, The Hollies, and more. They truly epitomized not only psychedelia and defined it for the many acts they produced for, but they also completely pinpointed what specifically the 60s take on the Middle Ages would come to be known as. When we think of 60s medieval revival, this is what we think of, and it's incredible. But medieval revival wasn't done evolving yet. Oh no. Because another era of gothic revival was on the horizon. And the 80s to 2000s and up to the present day have a lot to say about medieval gothic style and its relation to 90s witch goth. <laughs> you are absolutely familiar with the medieval revival witchcraft aesthetics that dominated media like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, The Craft, Practical Magic, Charmed, and various early 2000s Halloween flicks like the Halloween Town series. Clearly the association of witchcraft with the Middle Ages has long been established, so it makes sense that in modern reimaginations of witches, their style would also harken back to a somewhat medieval style. In Buffy, Willow was frequently dressed in these gothy dresses medieval-esque jewelry, etc., and of course any self-respecting witch in the 90s often gravitated towards a style that meshed both these medieval styles and elements of 80s and 90s goth-goth, which pulled a great deal from Victorian romantic styles. See, it all comes full circle. The Victorians borrow from the Middle Ages, the witchy 90s kids borrow from the Victorians, and now Gen Z and young millennials are borrowing from the witchy aesthetic that dominated the 90s and early 2000s, with the advent of TikTok's whimsy goth aesthetic. Whimsy goth takes vintage plus mysticism and makes it new again. Miranda Vandergriff explains, I'm drawn to whimsy goth because it combines dark rich colors with feminine silhouettes and celestial motifs. Whimsy goth can be described as 90s to 70s. I've always admired Stevie Nicks and her dark bohemian wardrobe, and I also find myself gravitating towards grungy 90s styles when I'm thrifting. It's a little bit fairy tale, a little bit witchy, and a lot of fun to style. There it is again. Fairy tales. What all of these revival movements have in common is fantasy and fairy tales and their association with the Middle Ages thanks to folks like the Pre-Raphaelites cementing that idea. Susan Hodara continues, The practice of culling from the past began with Romanticism. Before that, fashions were pretty much new from century to century. Then Romanticism came along and started picking up inspiration from the past and reorganizing it into new looks. And we've been doing it ever since. Now, a part of this current revival puzzle we've got going on right now is personal to me. Enyakor, which you may have heard of if you float around TikTok fashion circles. This style is named, of course, after the amazing New Age singer Enya, who I have always adored. I grew up hearing her music god knows where, probably on a CD that my parents had, and then the minute that YouTube was invented, I instantly discovered her beautiful, fantastical music videos. I was completely enchanted by her fashion, which always looked like something that the love of my life Arwen Lord of the Rings would wear, which is fitting because I was first exposed to Enya through her song, May It Be, which she sang for Lord of the Rings. and. I am big into that series, if it's not already easy to tell. So her style is ancient, velvety, flowing, and a clear hearkening back to the pre-Raphaelites damsels. Her voice echoes as if you're hearing it floating through a misty forest. 
and shocking no one, she literally lives in an actual castle. <laughs> so Enya Core, a style made to channel the new agey witchy medieval aesthetic that Enya embodies, includes all of these elements with a bit more armor, chainmail, and wooden and metal home decor. It's like a cross between whimsy goth and nightcore, with elements of Fleawood Mac and Kate Bush thrown into the mix. It's like the Ren Fair all year round for your slightly more moody sensibility. So what do styles like Enyakor and Whimsygoth have to say about how we perceive the past and the Middle Ages? As I mentioned earlier, the appeal of past styles not only in fashion but in the worlds of interior design, architecture, music, and more is a symptom of a disillusionment with the future. Y2K futurism dreamed of a fun, eccentric, and inviting future, but in the decade following, for example, the 2008 recession and the war on terrorism, as well as the last several years of social unrest and a slow slip into a new level of American fascism rather than inventing our own 2020s view of a bright future, we recede instead into bringing back Y2K and the futurism of our childhoods when that still seemed possible. The same can be said, obviously, for styles that the youth are too young to have experienced firsthand, but instead tap into via a second or third hand exposure to its dreams and fantastical promises. The peace of cottagecore, the magic of whimsy goth, the power of nightcore. Simon Reynolds writes in his book Retromania, what seems to have happened is that the place that the future once occupied in the imagination of young music makers has been displaced by the past. That's where the romance now lies, with the idea of things that have been lost. The accent today is not on discovery, but on recovery. Many scholars use these facts as a reason to critique the love of retro as an unhealthy escapism for the youth, claiming that a fixation on the aesthetics and pop culture of the past suffocates the present. But I want to personally push back on that and, looking at the eras that we've explored in this video, offer an alternate perspective. What is a revival, if not a product of our present? The past is gone. It's impossible for us to completely recede into it. No matter what, we can only interpret the past through modern eyes. And I think in many ways, that's an incredibly special thing. It's an opportunity to connect with our predecessors and acknowledge and explore ways that the past has shaped our present. A revival is not a selfish use escape. It's a love letter to the persisting and ever-evolving beauty of human creativity. And in few places is this more present than in the world of fashion. These modern interpretations of the Middle Ages, hundreds of years after the era ended, may not be wholly accurate to what the Middle Ages really was, or what it looked like, or what the people wore, but in the forever shifting and increasingly frail memories of the past, what we pick and choose to remember and to represent an era says more about us than it does about the Middle Ages. The people of the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries looking back at the Middle Ages and still finding beauty within it to reinvent in our image is an incredibly beautiful thing regardless of if it's an escapist thing or not. It's us looking back at people who came long before us and saying, I see you, you were here, what you made was beautiful. Can I keep you alive? As David Lowenthal says in The Past is a Foreign Country Revisited, the past is everywhere. All around us live features with more or less familiar antecedents. Relics, histories, memories suffuse human experience. Most past traces ultimately perish and all that remain are altered, but they are collectively enduring. Noticed or ignored, cherished or spurned, the past is omnipresent. To know we are ephemeral lessees of age-old hopes and dreams that hath animated generations of endeavor secures our place now to rejoice, now to regret, in the scheme of things. Thank you for learning with me about the immortality of the medieval style. I just want to take a minute here to self-promo. <laughs> Longtime viewers may remember this, but I have a graphic novel coming out this September from Getty Publications. Liberated, The Radical Art and Life of Claude Gahan is a graphic biography of the incredible life of queer Jewish artist and anti-Nazi resistance fighter Claude Gahan and their partner Marcel Moore. It's now available for pre-order on several platforms, which I have compiled in a list on my site, so I'll link that below. I really hope you all enjoy this book. I had such a great time working with the Getty 
team and researching, writing, and illustrating it myself. So anyway, <laughs> let me know if you pre-order it. So until next time, wash thy hands, wear thy mask, and don't forget to wear thy sunscreen as well. Mm -hmm.